there's a lot of bad information out there about layers 5, 6, and 7 of the OSI model. In fact, there are many resources out there that describe the OSI model as merely something to memorize. I think that's a huge disservice. There's a way of understanding the OSI model from a practical perspective, as a series of components that all contribute towards making the internet work. That's the strategy I took when I published my two videos on the OSI model. Those videos focused on layers 1 through 4. The most common request I got in the comments of those videos was to continue with layers 5, 6, and 7. So here we are. The OSI model consists of seven different layers that each have a specific responsibility which contribute to the overall goal of networking, which is to allow two users to use computers to share data between each other. If each layer is doing its responsibility successfully, then the goal of networking is attained, which means the internet works. There are many resources that unpack layers 1, 2, 3, and 4, but very few that really pick apart layers 5, 6, and 7. I call these the forgotten layers of the OSI model. Part of that is because the other popular networking models, the TCP IP models, simply combine these layers as a single aggregated application layer. Now, there's good reason for that, and you'll understand those reasons towards the end of this video. But what I want to do in this video is unpack the details of layer 5, 6, and 7, and specifically how each of those layers contribute towards the goal of networking. Before we can understand these layers, however, we have to understand the layers beneath it. Specifically, you must understand the terms hop-to-hop, end-to-end, and service-to-service, and how each of those apply towards the goal of networking. If you're unfamiliar with those terms, then please check out my other two videos on the OSI model. I promise it'll be the best take on not only understanding the OSI model, but also how to explain it to others. With that said, let's get into the forgotten layers of the OSI model, starting with layer 5. To understand layer 5 of the OSI model, you have to understand that this model was created long before the days of personal computers, or PCs. Back in those days, computing was done on large, massive machines called mainframes, and these were often so big that they took up entire rooms. The computing resources on these enormous mainframes were then accessed by people using what is known as dumb terminals, which were effectively just a monitor and a keyboard plugged into these mainframes. No actual processing of data was done on these dumb terminals. All the actual computing was done on the mainframes. Fun fact, this was also the model that Linux was created in. This is why Linux is often described as a multi-user operating system. In any case, all the computing was done on these large mainframes, and users would connect to these mainframes using dumb terminals. And then, those mainframes were then connected to other mainframes, which also had their own set of users using their own set of dumb terminals. And here, we can define the problem that Layer 5 is meant to solve. Notice this blue user is using this mainframe to speak to this blue user using that mainframe. At the same time, these two green users are also speaking to each other using these two mainframes. Well, if both of those mainframes are doing all the computing and sending of the data between each other, then the packets that are sent from this mainframe to the other are going to have the same layer 2 address, like a MAC address, the same layer 3 address, like an IP address, and even potentially the same layer 4 addresses, like ports. Which then begs the question, how is the data between these two blue users going to be kept separate from the data between these two green users? That's where layer 5 comes into play. Layer 5 is there to distinguish between user sessions. It allows networking protocols to identify a user independently from their layer 2, layer 3, or layer 4 addresses. Okay, so that makes sense, but is layer 5 simply an artifact of legacy computing on these mainframe computers? Well, no. You actually use something that I would categorize as a layer 5 component every day when you're browsing the web. Let me show you. Let's say these two blue users are not using mainframes to speak to each other. and Instead, this user is actually a web server for the site site.com, and this user is simply someone using a mobile phone. This mobile phone is currently logged into a Wi-Fi network at this user's house. And this phone uses this connection to log into the site, site.com. But what happens if this user then decides that they want to go to a coffee shop and connect to the Wi-Fi network there? Since this is a different network, they're going to have a new IP address, which means this information is going to change. And if the website is identifying this user, 
with layer one through four information, then this user is going to have to log back into the website every time they connect to a new Wi-Fi network, because in each case, they're going to be getting a new IP address. Instead, since we're using HTTP to access this website, HTTP has a functionality known as HTTP cookies. These cookies are simply arbitrary text strings that store user-specific information that is created by the server. What happens is when the user logs into the website, the server generates one of these cookies and sends it to the user. This cookie then stays with the user. And if this user logs into a new Wi-Fi network with new layer 234 information, that user still has the same cookie. And the website can still identify this user independent from whatever layer 2, layer 3, and layer 4 addresses that that user might maintain. So you see, HTTP cookies are a perfect example of layer 5's responsibilities in the OSI model. They allow the network to identify user independently from the layer 2, 3, and 4 addresses. Which then brings us to layer 6. To understand the presentation layer, we're going to simulate a packet arriving on the web server for site.com. Recall that every packet is really nothing more than a series of ones and zeros. And because of the rest of the layers of the OSI model, we know that this packet was successfully delivered to the web server, arrived to the right MAC address, arrived to the right IP address, arrived to the right port, and arrived to the right user session. Which now brings us to layer six. What layer six does is it tells us how to interpret the ones and zeros. There are many ways to interpret those ones and zeros. For example, should we group those ones and zeros in sets of six bits as base64 encoding would require? This would mean each combination of six bits would turn into a new base64 character. Or should we interpret those ones and zeros in groups of four bits? This is what hexadecimal would require, where each group of four ones and zeros represents a new hexadecimal character. Or should we interpret those ones and zeros as long numbers or integers? If we were to interpret all these ones and zeros as 32-bit numbers, this number would be 1 billion and change, and this number would be 796 million and change. Alternatively, maybe we're interpreting this as a single large 64-bit number, in which case this string of 64 ones and zeros could be translated to this huge number in decimal. So you see, that's what layer six tells us. It tells us what do we do with these ones and zeros. Now, earlier, we use HTTP as an example, and we can continue to do so. HTTP as a protocol uses extended ASCII encoding. Extended ASCII takes all the ones and zeros and groups them into sets of eight bits and interprets each of those eight bits as a different ASCII character. This combination of ones and zeros translates to the letter G. And this combination of ones and zeros translates to the letter E. And this combination translates to the letter T, and so on. And that's what layer six provides. It tells us what to do with the received ones and zeros that have been successfully processed through the OSI model and delivered to the right user session. Which then brings us to layer seven. If layer six told us how to interpret the ones and zeros that have been received, layer seven will tell us what do we do with the interpreted characters. Or said another way, layer seven will actually define the application commands. These three bytes of ones and zeros turn into the letters G, E, and T. And the command get in HTTP is the command you would use to fetch a particular web page. What you're seeing here is actually the first eight characters of an HTTP request asking for the page simple.html using HTTP 1.1 from the host pracnet.net. And if that looks familiar, that's because it's the exact HTTP request we made in my last video, where I showed you how to make an HTTP request using Telnet. And if you haven't seen that video, I think that one plus this video work well together to really explain how networking protocols work. Either way, that is what layer seven of the OSI model does. And that actually concludes my description of what the forgotten layers of the OSI model actually do. But before I let you go, there's a few more ideas I have to leave you with. Throughout this lesson, we've been using HTTP as our example protocol. We told you that HTTP to accomplish the goals of session management uses HTTP cookies. And for layer six, HTTP uses extended ASCII encoded. And for layer seven, HTTP has its own set of application commands. But there are other protocols that exist beyond just HTTP. 
for example, FTP. Well, it doesn't really make sense for FTP to use HTTP cookies to accomplish its layer 5 goals. FTP is in fact free to choose how to implement layer 5 in any way it deems necessary, or to not implement it at all. FTP, in fact, doesn't have a way to identify a user session independent from the layers below it. FTP uses layer 3 and layer 4 information to identify a user which means if you are in the middle of an FTP session and your IP address changes, you're going to have to log back in to that FTP server. For layer six, FTP also uses extended ASCII encoding. And for layer seven, FTP has its own set of application commands. So that's just HTTP and FTP, two of the maybe thousands of protocols that exist. And you can see that each of those protocols can implement layers five, six, and seven in whatever way that makes the most sense for that particular application. That is why the TCP IP models combine those layers into a single aggregate application layer. Since every protocol and application is going to implement their own way of doing these three goals, it makes sense to combine those as a single application layer. So in the end, whether you're using the seven layer OSI model, the five layer TCP IP model, or even the somewhat legacy four layer TCP IP model, one way or another, each of these are merely models. They are simply a way of understanding computer networking. Don't try too hard to fit everything you learn in the networking world into one of these layers or one of these models. That's not the goal. These are simply abstractions to teach you how computer networking can work. In the end, each of these models are there to teach you the concept of layers of abstraction. One layer has a responsibility and that precludes the other layers from having to worry about that responsibility. Layer three can do its job of end-to-end -end delivery without having to worry about how the ones and zeros are going to be delivered across every router in the path. And HTTP cookies work the same whether you're using IPv4 or IPv6. Each layer's goals are abstracted from the other layers. Understanding the OSI model or the TCP IP model in that way will set you up for success when you're learning deeper things in the networking world like tunneling and underlays and overlays. So that's my take on layers five, six, and seven of the OSI model. Hopefully you now have a more solid understanding of how these layers work and why they're often simply aggregated as a single application layer. If you enjoyed this lesson, then check out my new course called Networking the internet, the cloud, and everything in between. It's currently under construction and you can join now at a discounted rate to get permanent access and help shape this into the best networking course possible. Otherwise, if you think more people should understand and explain layers five, six, and seven this way, then help me out by liking, commenting, and subscribing. That would help me with the YouTube algorithm. Or if so inclined, please share this video amongst your peers. That would really help me out and I would appreciate it greatly. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you got a lot out of it and I'll see you in the next one.